Hello, this is the devotion for the last Sunday of our church year, Christ our King. And our theme for worship is, Lord, keep us joyful in Christ our King. On this last Sunday of the church year, we rejoice because God fulfilled his great plan of salvation through Christ our King. And we rejoice because even though that Christ died, he, he rose again. And he still reigns to this day, always looking over us, always shepherding us, the one who will someday conquer our, all of our enemies, especially that last enemy, death. We rejoice and look forward to the day when every single knee is going to bow along with ours as we praise our King of Kings and, and the Lord of Lords. We begin this morning. O oh Lord, teach us your ways that we may walk in your truth. You comfort and help us day by day. We trust in your loving care. You are the King of heaven and earth. We give you praise and thanks. Hallelujah. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. Our prayer of the day for today. Lord Jesus Christ, by your victory, you have broken the power of the evil one. Fill our hearts with joy and peace as we look with hope to the day when every creature in heaven and earth will acclaim you as King of Kings and Lord of Lords to your unending praise and glory. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We turn to our scripture lessons for today. Our first lesson is from Ezekiel chapter 34. We read select verses. For this is what the Lord God says. Here I am. I myself will seek the welfare of my flock and carefully search for them. As a shepherd searches for his flock when his sheep that were with him have been scattered, so I will search for my flock and rescue them from all the places they were scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and bring them to their own soil. I will shepherd them on the mountains of Israel, in the valleys and in all the settlements of the land. I will lead them into good pasture and their grazing land will be on the high mountains of Israel. There they will lie down in good grazing land, and they will pasture on rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will shepherd my flock. I myself will let them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost. I will bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured. I will strengthen the weak. I will destroy the fat and the strong, and I will shepherd them with justice. Then I will raise up over them one shepherd, and he will tend them. My servant David will tend them, and he will be their shepherd. I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be the prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. This is the word of our God. Our second lesson for today is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We read verses 20 through 28. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came by a man, the resurrection of the dead also is going to come by a man. For is as in Adam they all die, so also in Christ they all will be made alive but each in his own order. 
Christ as the first fruits, and then Christ's people at his coming. Then comes the end, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has done away with every other ruler and every other authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Death is the last enemy to be done away with. Certainly, he has put all things in subjection under his feet. Now, when it says that all things have been put in subjection, obviously that does not include the one who subjected all things to him. But when all things have been subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him, in order that God may be all in all. This is the word of our God. Our verse of the day today, Alleluia. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Alleluia. Our gospel for this Christ the King Sunday is from Matthew chapter 27. We read verses 27 through 31. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole cohort of soldiers around him. Sorry about that. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole cohort of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. They twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand, knelt in front of him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spit on him, took the staff, and hit him repeatedly on his head. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. This is the gospel of our Lord. What would it be like to have a king? For people like us in America, where we have the voting system, where we elect somebody who's given temporary power at the consent of the governed with with these checks and balances and other other branches of government to limit the power of that one person. Having a king, it's a whole lot different. For people in ancient times and in, in some places today, what the king says, that's the law. There, there's no need for courts. There's no need for juries. There's no need for lawyers. Because what the king says, that king's decree, it settles everything for better or for worse. But there was something else that a king did, at least if he was a proper king. A proper king would fight for his kingdom. When Israel asked for their first king, they said that they wanted to be like all the other nations and that Our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. See, a king was the very first to face the enemies. The the first to draw his sword, the first to, to charge into battle, leading the rest of the fighting men, and the first to take aim at those who threatened the kingdom and his subjects. This last Sunday of the church year is often called Christ the King Sunday. Our scripture lessons that we just read, they they focus our eyes of faith on Jesus' glorious rule as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That Old Testament lesson, it foretold Jesus as the king from David's royal line. One who would be a faithful shepherd for God's people. Unlike some of the other kings that the Israelites had, King David had passed away by the time that the Old Testament was written. It was talking about the David that God would bring back. It was a reference to to Christ. The epistle lesson tells of Jesus' kingdom and, and how he will rule all things until he has put every single enemy under his feet, right down to that very last enemy, death. And like a good king, our king went ahead of us and fought our enemies for us. In our gospel, Matthew records how this victory came about. And it came about in kind of a strange way, didn't it? There's no no battle scenes where the the king is dressed in shining armor. 
where, where the king stands off against the enemy and trades blows until the enemy is defeated. No, this battle scene is by all outward appearances kind of pathetic, isn't it? See, the victory that, that we needed, it required a heavy price. God's son, our king, had to die. Because without his death, there would be no forgiveness of sins, no relationship with God other than one with an angry judge and a, and a helpless sinner. There would be no freedom. There would be the fear of death and hell. There would be no hope of heaven. The eternal future of every person hinges on that cross, on that battlefield. Jesus isn't led to his execution as a powerless prisoner. He is marching majestically to the cross as a king prepared for battle. Christians, see your king on that cross as he fights the battle for your soul. And live in praise because of what he did. We can't really imagine what it was like for Jesus on that, on that terrible, terrible day. People who had no clue and had no care who he was and what he came to do for them stripped him of his dignity. They mocked him. They humiliated him. They brutally abused him, both physically and emotionally. They bowed before him in some kind of sick sarcasm and then tossed him aside like you would with trash. The Gospel writer John writes in his first chapter, he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was, which was his own, but his own did not receive him. And we ask the question, how, how could this be? Jesus is the Almighty God. Our times, everybody's times, are in his hands. Right? We, we pray, along with the psalmist, the eyes of all look to him, to you, O Lord, and he gives them their fruit at the proper time. He is completely faithful. He commands our total trust. He is holy. He demands our absolute holiness. Yet we see this, this, this king going to battle, and he remains silent. He lets himself be blasphemed. He lets himself be ridiculed. Those who did these hideous things to Jesus had no clue who he really was or what they were doing. If they had, they never would have crucified the Lord of glory. If people today really knew who Jesus really is and what they are going to do to him, they wouldn't dare do those things, right? They wouldn't defy him in every form of media. They wouldn't sneer at the idea of teaching his truth in every step of education. They wouldn't brush him off or make jokes about him and his word. Yet, they do. Look around you and you see all kinds of mockery aimed at God and his word. People's lives are like a, like, a, like a Twitter message that reads, hashtag not my king. And if we're honest, we don't always see him as our king either, do we? we? We fail to give him the obedience that we know we should and instead insist on obeying our own cravings. Hmm? We, we fail to give him our, our time and attention each day as we should and instead we spend our time on, on trivial and in sometimes some ways, some sinful ways. And we hear the arguments and excuses that our hearts want to give. I, I, I can't be expected to be perfect all the time, right? I don't need Jesus sprinkled in everything that I do, right? As if Jesus isn't the king. As if he doesn't see the thoughts of our hearts. It's as if he's weak. Our everyday apathy toward God, it's just as damning as those who crucified the king on that hill outside of Jerusalem. And the people admire the, the strong man who fights back. We're impressed with raw power and, and in-your-face comebacks and heroes who never fall. We love the, the special effects in movies that thrill us and keep us on the edge of our seats. We enjoy being entertained. But Jesus didn't come to entertain. He came to die. He came down to lay, he came to lay his life down as a ransom for sin. No special effects, no payback to his tormentors. Only real, selfless, redeeming love for you. In our gospel, we heard, we heard Matthew write, they led him away to crucify him. Right? His, those tormentors, they had no idea that King Jesus 
was actually preparing for battle. His battlefield was a Roman cross, the instrument of torture. His battle was a fight for your soul. Those proud captors had no idea that they were being used by God when they nailed his son to those, to those cross beams. They had no idea that when they grabbed Jesus, they were, handing the de- they were handling the death of death itself. They put Jesus exactly where he needed to be, fastened to a cross. When Jesus was crucified, God for, for six hours burned in the agony of eternal punishment, fighting the battle for the souls of every man, woman, and child in history. Then after he had suffered the full payment for sin, in triumph, he cried, It is finished. The gates of sin's prison were opened for you and for me. He obliterated the power of the devil, opened heaven's door to all who would believe in him. Three days later, Jesus destroyed that power of death when he burst from the grave. And after 40 days returned to his glorious throne in heaven, where, as Paul says, where God had appointed him to be head over everything for the church. Which again means for you. Your king took the worst possible thing that sinful man could ever have done to him, and he turned it into the best thing that he could ever do for sinful man. When Jesus died, those who lived in and around Jerusalem felt the aftershock of his conquest in the tremors of an earthquake, but many others heard the message of Jesus' suffering, death, and resurrection, and it would be the power. And the Greek word Paul uses is the same root we get the word dynamite from, the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. That that beaten, bloody, humiliated, dead man was the last sight that a lot of the world had of Jesus. He's yesterday's news, a footnote in history. He has no relevance in the day-to-day routine of life. But one day, every single eye will see him return in blinding glory and in colossal power. Everyone will watch him raise dead bodies back to life, put them back together. Bodies that all of human experience and could never live again. Whether it's things like mass graves where murderers hid and their slaughtered multitudes, all, all the ashes that have been scattered over the oceans, all the babies that have been tossed into dumpsters, all the dead, great and small, will rise and stand before him. They will hear the sound of creation breaking apart and vanishing before their eyes. There will be no more arguing, no more debate, no more mockery. And those who would not have King Jesus will finally be forced to admit the truth. As Paul writes to the Philippians in chapter 2, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name, that is above above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This king that went to battle for you to fight the battle that you could not possibly hope to fight, let alone win, this is his love for you. This king who showed his power over Satan, over death. The king who has the power to do anything that he wants to sinners, like you and me. He used that awesome, wonderful power to fight the battle for your soul. What a stunning conquest he's achieved for you. That's why God the Father raised him from the dead. Nothing brings King Jesus more joy than to have every sinner repent and receive the spoils of his conquest, the forgiveness of sins and life. Countless angels and all the souls in heaven praise Jesus for shedding his blood to rescue you and me from the power of sin and death. John was given the wonderful vision that he recorded in the book of Revelation of the multitude of people around the throne praising Jesus for exactly this, exactly what he had, what he did. John records in Revelation chapter 5, You are worthy because you were slain. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and honor and glory and praise. See, it was not with perishable things that you were redeemed, the Apostle Peter wrote, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without defect. You were brought, you were bought with a price, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians. What a price this is. See, through faith in in this royal, precious blood of God's own Son, you have God's promise 
that you will be with him in heaven and you will join everyone else who has washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. There's no good thing you can do. There's not enough good things you can possibly try to do that can do what the blood of the lamb and only the blood of the lamb does. And with this blood, our Savior keeps our hope alive, even, even in his supper where we, where we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes as we eat and drink that body and blood of the lamb. In fact, we proclaim his death every single day of our lives, don't we? Those who have been set free from the enemies of their souls through the blood of their king, we live in praise of the king's conquest. The Apostle Paul declared this to be his entire life's purpose. He wrote to the Galatians, The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. You were bought with a price, therefore honor God with your body. Right? Yes, take it all, my gracious King. My hands, my feet, my lips, my mind, my heart, my silver and my gold, my time. All you have is mine. All I have is yours. This is the confession of a Christian. There's never been a more worthy king that's ever lived. There's never been a greater conquest that's been won. A greater need has never been filled. A greater reason for praise has never existed. Jesus is your king. He is my king. And in his hands, we are safe. Listen again to what Ezekiel wrote in his, in his book. I myself will tend my sheep. And have them lie down, declares the Sovereign Lord. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak. But the, the fat and the strong, the rich and the strong is the picture there. I will destroy. I will save my flock and they will no longer be plundered. I will place over them one shepherd, one servant, David, and he will tend them. He will tend them and be their shepherd. I, the Lord, will be their God and my servant, David will be prince among them. Friends, hail King Jesus, the shepherd who watches over us every single day, who guides us, who feeds us, who cares for us, who keeps us safe. May this be the song of our lives. Amen. We pray. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all people throughout the world to strengthen believers and to enlighten unbelievers, we pray, Lord, have mercy. For peace and justice among nations, for honest leaders and good neighbors, for the gift of love, for steadfast faith and patient endurance, we pray, Lord, have mercy. For those who suffer pain or sorrow, for the lonely and depressed, for the poor and needy, for those who love us and those who hate us, we pray, Lord, have mercy. Be gracious to us, defend us by your power, and bring us to glory everlasting. To you, O King of kings and Lord of lords, we entrust ourselves. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Almighty and Merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless us and preserve us. Amen.